The villa approach has changed drastically over the course of 12 to 18 months. And he's been one step ahead of how teams react to Villa every single time. A lot of the criticism that Unai Emery gets from the wider footballing world is that there's an Unai Emery cycle. Mm. That he starts off really well, but there comes a point quite quickly, normally a couple of years in, where things start to go bad. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to the 90 Min channel. We've got a very special episode for you today. It's an Aston Villa edition. They're having a cracking season at the time of recording. They're sitting fifth in the Premier League. Unai Emery has turned the club around. Now you might be wondering why it's me in the host chair and not Jakey. Well, the guys nominated me to do this video because of my admiration for Unai Emery and uh, some of my comments about his management in the past. Uh, but I'm not the expert here. I'm just the one asking the questions. And I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by, first of all, 90 Min's very own uh, Canton Jesp. Canton, good to see you. Thanks a lot, mate, for having me. It's great to speak a bit about Villa. I'm happy about it. <laughs> I tried to, to do the name as French yeah, as I could. It, it, it wasn't good, quite pretty there. Impressive. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. Um, we've also got Sam Ty with us as well, uh, another Aston Villa fan. Good to have you uh, back in the hot seat. How you doing? Good, mate. Good. Very well indeed. Uh, my name is a little bit easier to pronounce. Um, well, I would have said it wrong if you didn't tell me <laughs> earlier in the day how it is supposed to be pronounced. So... We got there in the end. We got there in the end. Um, guys, look, let's talk Aston Villa. We're going to talk about the season in general. We'll talk Unai Emery in, in quite a bit of detail as well because whatever my feelings of him uh, in the past and, and my thoughts on his management at my club, he's been brilliant for Aston Villa. He's been a breath of fresh air. Um, Canton, just quickly, how did you become a Villa fan? Because when I first met you and you know we spoke about you know the fact that you're from France and I was like, how did you end up being a Villa fan? This is a really nice story. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a long story. But um, when I was a kid, I used to watch a lot of Premier League with my dad. And um, I don't know, I fell in love with the colours uh, at first. And I was just like, you know what? We don't have these associations of colours uh, in France. So I was just like, this is my club now. And then I fell in love with the players, the team uh, back in the days. And I, I looked at the history and I, I felt like, this was my club, so, you know, uh, we say, don't choose Aston Villa, it's Aston Villa that chooses you. That's so. it, absolutely. Well, and which it, years were these, by the way? Which Premier League years? It's around like 2004, 2005, 2006. Not yeah. great years then. No, 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 <laughs> but it's just like, no. the players at the time were, yeah. yeah this is know. just before Martin O'Neill takes over, right? So it's probably David exactly. O'Leary. It's about yeah. the time I actually mentally checked out of Aston Villa for a while, <laughs> for my own mental health. Um, I checked back in again a, a little bit later, so... Yeah, yeah, I mean, you must have really loved those colours yeah. to have picked Villa <laughs> during that period because it was not the best. Yeah, but there were some nice players like, you know, Olaf Melberg, um, yeah. uh, Anger at the time, then there was Ashley Young, Gareth Barry. Those yeah. were yeah. the players I recognised as my favourite ones at the time. So yeah. The ones that got you hooked. All yeah. good players. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Canton covers Aston Villa uh, for 90 minis, travelling up and down the country, watching them every single week. Uh, Sam is everywhere, basically, on any broadcast outlet because he's brilliant and in great demand. Um, look, let's start with you, Sam. Aston Villa, fifth at the moment. Um, it looks like they're going to finish at least, at the very least, in the top six, which is a really, really good achievement, I think, when you consider where... Unai Emery picked them up. What's your kind of overall assessment of the season up until this point? Because I don't think, regardless of what happens between now and the end, there's going to be too much difference in the kind of opinion uh, on how Villa are fed. The only thing that can really change the opinion is if somehow Villa actually do finish below fifth place. Um, because there has been a little bit of a psychological blow recently, having actually dropped out of fourth and into fifth. Villa have been in the top four for ages, like since basically December or November. I mean, I do lose count of it. They've been there the entire time. You know, the Arsenal and City back-to-back -back wins, really firmly entrenched above City at one point. So to actually now very recently drop below Tottenham for the first time has been a little bit difficult to take. But the only way you can really spin that into a true negative, and, and people will be really exasperated by that, is if you go one further and you drop below Man United, you, you can't finish below this Man United team. It, it would genuinely be quite embarrassing because you watch them, we all watch them every week. They're not very good. We know that they get points when you don't really understand how, but with the buffer that Villa have had on United consistently eight to 11 points for the last few months, the only way this can go wrong is for Villa to finish below Man United. As long as that doesn't happen, it is a season to be tremendously proud of. I mean, even still, it's a season to be proud of because you can't just discount the fact that for mm. 
seven very long months. Villa have put in some amazing performances. They've gained some amazing wins, some incredible experiences. Like I went out to, to Poland to watch Villa play Legia Warszawa, as you say, Legia Warsaw, Warszawa. Um, you know, Villa away trip for the first time in 13 years. Um, been to Villa Park to see them play Zrinski, to see them play Ajax. These are headline fixtures, headline names. The season has just been full of amazing positives, hasn't it? So no matter what happens, unless they finish below Man United, it's, yeah. it's something to be really proud of. And I don't think that's going to happen. So I think you're it safe It doesn't seem that. likely. It's not likely at all, I, I would say that. And I think when I, because I'm removed from the situation, I can say that yeah. without there being any sort of nerves uh, playing into it. Um, Canton, obviously Villa have spent quite a bit of money over the last few years. And I'm here to play devil's advocate a little bit. They have spent quite a bit of money. They've brought in some talented players. The fact that Unai Emery came in and made an impact so quickly, does that say more about Unai Emery and how good he is as a manager? Or does it say more about how badly Steven Gerrard was doing at that point. That's a bit of um, of both, I think. That's a, a very good mix of that. Uh, I just think Unai Emery just showed how good he is as a manager. Uh, he has proved that in the past, everywhere he went, he, he managed to succeed, basically. Um, you could speak about uh, Arsenal, you could speak about PSG, but overall, I think most of the people would recognize him as one of the best managers in the, the whole Europe. Um, so, yeah, Steven Gerrard was really bad. Um, nothing was really working under him. But ever since Unai Emery joined, everything changed. The culture, uh, the players level, um, the confidence in the manager inside the ground. So everything went really well. And yeah, that's all credit to Unai Emery, in my opinion. I don't mean this disrespectfully, but is Villa, Sam, almost the perfect landing place for Unai Emery? Because there is you know, that big club value. They are a big football club. They've got great support. Mm. They've got a talented group of players. They've got the resource to be able to constantly improve that. But there also isn't that pressure that Unai Emery would have experienced at Paris Saint-Germain or at Arsenal. So is it like the perfect landing spot for him? Yeah, I think over the last decade or maybe 15 years, we've got a really good sense for the level of club that Unai Emery is perfectly suited to managing. And we've got examples almost on both ends of the extremes. And I think it's pretty clear that Emery needs to come in at a certain level with a certain calibre of player. And again, I mean, don't, no disrespect to, to, to Villa and the players as I say this, but it doesn't appear to me that Unai Emery can manage superstars, whether it's the ego attached to them or the fact that they are just incredibly good players that basically don't want to listen to his very intense, detailed tactical instructions. He needed to pick up Villa at a very low point and really take, on, take this hands-on approach and when it immediately begin, work, begins working, and by immediately begins, I mean Villa beat Manchester United at home in his debut. It was the first time Villa had beaten Man United at Villa Park since 1995. Wow. I mean, it's a hell of a landmark to tick off immediately. And it's that immediate hit of dopamine where you're like, this works. Everything we're doing, everything he is telling us, it works. And the run that Villa went on through last season to, to sneak into seventh was brilliant. Everything he tried worked. The, the dynamic of the team was fantastic. All the players improved exponentially, which does speak to the point that Gerard badly mismanaged them. I mean, look at Douglas Luiz now. He was there yeah. the whole time, right? The whole time. Esri Concert there the whole time. Gerard was not getting the best out of his team. But Emery needed to pick these players up at a, a lower point, a more fragile point. And they got on board with him very quickly because the results were there and he was improving them and the team was getting better. And I think that was probably what happened at Villarreal, working with a certain level of player, good, not great. And he's able to teach them stuff and they can take it from him and they can really listen to him and they're willing to listen to him. That's the other bit. Are you willing to listen to Unai Emery? Because I think maybe some of the players at Arsenal and PSG didn't fancy that. But Villarreal, Sevilla, Aston Villa, all the Villas, they well, do. He's a serial winner of trophies, right? And when someone like that arrives at a football club, that hasn't won many trophies in its recent history, yep. then all of a sudden people stand up and listen, don't they? Mm -hmm. um, Canton, talk to me a little bit about Unai Emery's style of play at Aston Villa, because I always find it hard to put my finger on what exactly Unai Emery is as a manager. I've seen him at times play with this really high line, really aggressive press and want to be the aggressor. And I've also seen him at other clubs be a little bit negative at times. I think you can say that, you know, some of his Sevilla teams they weren't great to watch. They were defensively savvy, but they did drop deep and allow other people to have the ball. 
What's the style of play at Villa? Is there a clear one? Is it adaptable? How do you see it? He adapts a lot. That's uh, the main thing. Is that when he started, he wanted a very uh, strong defensive line that would be able to uh, counter attack and score, like because they attacked really fast. Um, and now it changed a bit uh, recently, uh, mainly because of the injuries, because of the players that are not there or might be there but are not as great as uh, when they started. Uh, for example, when he started with uh, uh, Bailey and Diaby in the starting eleven. Now there's only one of them mainly, which is a massive difference in the approach of the game. Uh, he started maybe with a 4-3-3. Now it's more like 4-4-2, 4-2-2-2. Uh, so yeah. it's, a, it's a big of the change. Uh, and the, the main thing is that he adapts a lot uh, to the opponent, to the uh, injuries, to the players that are available for the games. And that's a massive approach. I, I think, think he also adapts to the situation Villa find themselves in, in regard to how they're being treated by opponents. Mm -hmm. So when he, he steps in, Villa are at a very low ebb and teams will probably try and take the game to Villa and Villa can play in that very reactive way and they were very good at picking their moments and playing reactively and all through the second half of last season it's a very very strong um, correlation between taking the lead and winning and a very strong correlation between scoring early yeah. and Villa were doing this thing where they would hold on to the ball at the back and pass it across and bait the press which we always talk about with Brighton and De Zerbe, you know, baiting the press and playing through it he did this players ran at Villa they cut through them in two passes, Louise Watkins' goal, and then they would see out the lead. This happened over and over and over again. And so towards the end of the season, I think teams were like, mm, maybe we should stop doing that. Maybe we should stop running at Villa and letting them play through them. He anticipates that. He buys Pau Torres, who is much better at breaking down deep blocks from left centre-back. He's a much more talented passer than someone like Tyron Mings and pretty much anybody else on the team. And he equips the team to deal with a new scenario, which is, OK, teams are going to stop doing that. They're going to start sitting in. We need to have the answers. So he's the Villa approach has changed drastically over the course of 12 to 18 months. And he's been one step ahead of how teams react to Villa every single time. Let me ask you this then. And uh, it is time to start playing a bit of devil's advocate on Unai Emery. He's managed a lot of football clubs, right? He's managed Lorca at the beginning of his career, Almeria, Valencia, his brief spell at Spartak, Moscow, Sevilla, PSG, Arsenal, Villarreal. Um, and obviously he's at Aston Villa now. Do you think that there is, and, and I'm going to put this to you first, Sam. A lot of the criticism that Unai Emery gets from the wider footballing world is that there's an Unai Emery cycle, mm. that he starts off really well, but there comes a point quite quickly, normally a couple of years in, where things start to go bad and he doesn't have the capacity to be able to turn it back around. Is that a fair criticism of Unai Emery's career to date? And do you think that could be a problem for Villa moving forward? It might be. I mean, look, we're not far enough into the Villa chapter to know to know that for sure. He's had all the answers so far. It might be fair based on previous jobs. But what I would say to that really is that three years is actually quite a long time for a manager nowadays. And it's really hard to keep coming up with new answers and continually finding new ways to stimulate groups of players over three, four, five, six years. The, the cases we point to with managers lasting more than three years feel much rarer than the other ones. So whether or not it's true is one question and whether or not it's fair to criticise it is another because hanging on for three plus years in the Premier League is actually really hard. It's mm. really, really difficult. Or the longest serving manager is usually someone on about six years and then there's a huge drop off. So how fair is it to even hold that up as a, as a criticism? I don't know. I think the modern player is really hard to stimulate and engage over and over again in new different ways. And a lot of managers struggle with it, not just Unai Emery. Do you struggle with that, Canton? Because I know that, you know, there are, you know, fans of other clubs that have been managed by Unai Emery that are probably always coming up to you guys and going, well, this is going to happen eventually. And you must get sick and tired of it. Yeah, that's that. But that's a fair criticism as well. Like when you start the season and you show the capacity that you would be able to maybe play a part into the uh, Premier League title race um, and then you drop off to the fifth place. Then there's fair criticism, but at the same time, when you look at the, st uh, the Villa squad, the injuries, the players that have been on and off, then I think Villa is at the right position at the moment and we'll judge him next year when eventually the, the thing happens. But at the same time, at the moment, I don't think there's 
massive drop off at the moment. There's really only Villa only have about 14 players, right? There's only so much you can do, and and they are limping at the moment towards the end of the season with having lost so many players to severe injuries. And as we speak at the moment, like it seems to be like McGinn comes back from a three game suspension and Louise immediately checks out for two. It's it's that time of year. It's tough to sustain performances at this point, and the results have dropped off a little bit. But sometimes I think about that and I, w- I wonder, why can't Villa hold on to a 2-0 lead here? What's going on? And I, ha- I have these flashbacks to Arsenal where he was very poor, really. Probably over-tinkered and maybe quite poor at holding on to leads. There's the whole remontada with PSG and Barcelona, which, you know, was really, really bad. All this stuff pops into my head. And then I sit back and I think, well, hang on a minute. It's only 18 months ago that he picked this team up in 17th place. There's only so much a man can do in that short space of time, given the injuries that he has faced, to fix everything. You can't fix everything in that time. And every, all the steps that they've taken so far should be commended. So I hold the criticism just a little bit because maybe you're asking Villa to be much more than is reasonable. Yeah. And I think the thing about the comebacks, I don't think that's fair. Like, I've been someone who's been quite critical of Unai Emery at times, but it's not about the comebacks. Like, for me, you're a manager, you set up a team, they go out on the pitch, They play in a certain way and they get themselves into a position where they are comfortably winning a football match. If they can't hold on to that, there has to be a portion of blame on the players. And I feel like with Emery, because there is this reputation, if you like, for throwing away leads, it's very easy and it's probably lazy journalism for people to go, oh, well, it's because it's a new Emery team. I don't think that's fair. Um, The other thing that I'm interested to get you guys' opinion on is you know, it's, it's a project at Villa, right? He, he picked them up in a difficult position and now Villa fans must be looking at it and going, this guy could potentially take us to a new... He already has taken you to a new level, if we're being honest. Yep. What's the communication like between Emery and the Villa fans? Because one of the things I found quite difficult when he was in charge of my club, and I don't want to keep doing that, but was it was a project. Then there was a lot of work that needed to be done and I thought that there was a, a lack of clear messaging coming across from him to the supporters and I actually think that worked against him in terms of people having less patience it seems to me from the outside like that's better now 100% Um, the very first thing I think he he took the lesson of um, when he was an Arsenal is this the lack of communication between the fans and uh, and the manager and the team Um, so he worked a lot on his English to improve it to have a better communication to the general public and ever since he joined, he spoke about the fans, he included them uh, into the victories. And that's a massive signal you send to the Villa fans because at the end of the Gerard era, um, he was just not communicating at all with the supporters. And the fans were like really frustrated by the situation because they thought like Gerard is not the right manager, not the right uh, guy that would take Villa to the next level and he he added the fans to his um, mentality he spoke about a winning mentality he spoke about a no excuse uh, no excuse culture and he includes the fans yeah. in everything he does and that's a massive uh, signal that he sends Harry, to a point this was mm. a bit of a tap in for Emery because Gerard communicated so poorly with the fan base and and in general that pretty much anything was going to be better. Like Gerard used to get out, out of a game that Villa had lost to, let's just go with Bournemouth, and he would just be like, the players aren't good enough. That's all, he would just shake his head and say, the players aren't good enough. And the fans know that that is not good enough. You can't just yeah. say, you can't just blame all the players. Like if it's a badly set up team, they played poorly, they couldn't hold onto the ball, they've offered no threat and they've conceded two at set pieces. And you're just going to say, oh, the players weren't good enough. That's a really low starting point. So just a little bit of positivity coming in there from Emery was going to make all the difference, get the fans on side. And also just a little bit further back in the history here, not too far back from, from Steven Gerrard, is Steve Bruce. This is probably going back about three years. Steve Bruce was a difficult, a difficult sell. And... Um, he used to sort of comment on the fans and he used to call Villa fans hysterical. He used that word quite, he used to use the word hysteria. Villa might lose a game or might draw and he'd go, oh, hysteria from the fans. And he would essentially intimate that the fans are overreacting. Don't do that. Yeah, That's a no. terrible method of communication. Yeah. This club is everything to these fans. Like football's expensive and you spend your money following your team and they, they, they hold a place in your heart. You don't want to watch your team lose a game that you should have won on quality and then be told you're overreacting to that result. So we're coming from a pretty low bar here, right? And Emery, just a bit of positivity, a bit of understanding, a bit of geeing up, that helps. But it's not necessarily the stuff that he says 
to the fans that I think impresses them. It's his general mantra. And you mentioned the no excuse culture. Mm -hmm. Villa fans love this. Yeah. Gary O'Neill complains constantly about injuries and we won on XG and stuff like that. And it, whatever. Um, there are other managers that do the same thing. Eddie Howe is consistently referencing injuries. Look, everyone's got injuries and we're not hiding from that. But every time Unai Emery gets asked about injury, he goes, it's not, not, it's not about that. It's not about that. We have no excuse culture in this football club. The next man must step up. He never, ever, ever lets anybody think about injuries or blames injuries. So he's just sending those correct messages and setting those standards that Villa, frankly, aren't used to. And again, this is part of it. Coming from that low bar, it's been a bit of an easy win for him to set those standards. Whereas you contrast it with Arsenal, it's a whole different ball game, isn't it, really? Yeah, and, and, and to be fair to him in that circumstance as well, the fans at that particular football club were fed up of what they'd seen for the last decade before him. Yeah. So it didn't take much for them to turn on him as well. Correct. Um, whereas... When you arrive and, and you speak about uh, European football and at the end of the season you deliver in just a few months, yeah. then it makes the world difference, I think. It yeah, does. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Taking fans into uncharted territory, places that they haven't been in recent history, mm, yeah. is, is massive, isn't it? And it for sure. It'll always do you good. Just a, a quick word on Ollie Watkins. He's been incredible this season. He's had a fantastic campaign. How much of his improvement, because it is consistent improvement in my opinion, yeah. do you put down to Emery coming in? Has he helped raise the bar with Watkins? Yeah, yeah. Watkins is very quick to, to praise Emery um, and his impact on him. I think that the thing we hear about the most is, is Watkins talks about how he has been told to waste less energy moving away from the centre of the pitch and making kind of endless channel runs and gassing himself out after 70 minutes and not really being in a good position to then make the difference a bit later on. So I think he's been he's been told to stay more in the centre of the pitch. I think his hold-up play has improved. Villa like to play the pass through the lines into Watkins and he sort of does the one-touch tap to the side to bring the number 10 into the position on the ball. So he's being used as a bit of a wall pass, a bit of a bounce pass. These things were not present in his game before. He was not exclusively, but very much like, I'm going to run the channel, I'm going to run the channel. There's, there's a place for that and he's a, he's a quick guy but I think he's mixed up his movements he understands the game better he conserves his energy for those big moments better and that's why he's always got I mean the shot power on this guy now has improved he can lash him and I'm pretty sure it's because he's not spending all of his energy running into the channels yeah. and chasing balls over to the touchline let somebody else do that or just don't do it at all so I think we've definitely seen some differences for sure if we were to end the season today and I know that we're, you know, a little bit short in terms of <laughs> there's a, a fair few games to go still. Quanton, who would be your player of the season for Aston Villa so far? Is I it as simple as saying Oli Watkins or is there someone else? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say uh, Oli Watkins because, you know, he's been involved in most of the uh, most of the goals. Uh, but you have to mention as well Leon Bailey, uh, who's been brilliant all season long. Uh, that's the first time ever since he joined Villa that is that consistent in most games. And even if is not great at certain games. He will find a way to become involved in goals and directly involved. Um, then you have to mention a bit of Douglas Luiz. Uh, he's been <laughs> how much time you got? Here? How many super... players are you going to bring up? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, but, that, but you're right. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Th there's like maybe four players you would mention, and maybe the last one would be either John McGinn or Ezri Kansa. I would go for Ezri Kansa because he's been like amazing this season. Amazing, that's the word, I think. The kit man, you're going to throw the kit man in there as well? The kit man, yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah. All, all the guys that do the security, fantastic job. Um, everyone on the ticket uh, ticket stalls, great stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th that's the thing. It's, it's, you feel like you say you pick one player and you feel you, you, feel you need to mention five more because mm. it's been that kind of season. And I would, I would presume it's the same for you. I, I, I've been looking at my player of the year picks recently um, and I've got about eight names. First of all, that's really weird. Usually it's like, oh, Kevin De Bruyne or Salah. Mm. But this this year it's really tough. And there's three or four Arsenal players that I throw into the conversation for player of the year. So to pick your own player of the season, I think is going to be really tough. And that's the, that's the symbol that you've had a great campaign. The team has really functioned very, very well. And um, you didn't mention Emiliano Martinez, which is pretty harsh from you. Um, <laughs> but that just goes to show there's even more to it. But for me, it's between Watkins or Douglas Luiz. Mm. Douglas Luiz is so consistent in there and he is so good. And he scored a lot. As he well. has, yeah, yeah, he has. It's been an amazing season for Aston Villa and I'm sure we're going to talk about them plenty between now and the end of the campaign. We can all agree, I think, that Unai Emery could be the manager of the season. Can we, can we say that? 
I'm gonna say it. Hey, if you say that, then I follow you. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, said could there's be. Some, there's some could good be. candidates, isn't yeah. there? Let's see who stays up and see who wins the title. <laughs> it's gonna be very, very interesting indeed. My thanks to Canton and to Sam as well. Make sure you follow the guys. Their handles are in the link below, or the links are in the description below, I should say. Um, thanks for watching, and we'll be back soon with more.